Perfect. All right. Well, I think we've all said good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. So I think we're um, good to go here. And we're looking forward to a good lecture here today from Dr. Arnold. And great, thank you. <clears throat> um, we are um, just kind of winding down to the last couple class periods that we have here. Um, we have today and Thursday, and then next week, Monday and Thursday as well. And appreciate you staying with us. We have the um, um, quite a bit of ground still to cover. Uh, I feel like I'm going to sneeze here in a moment. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and we um, today, of course, have Dr. Arnold talking about Jesus Christ as the center. We're going to talk about some of the methodology then regarding the center. And um, some of you have worked through the essay and done um, kind of given your own perspective on that. And I appreciate looking at that and reading over some of those. And also, um, then we have Dr. Brian Collins, who will be coming and talking about the land. And uh, next week, we'll be finishing up with some topics and also talking more about your paper. I have received a, just recently uh, a proposal that somebody gave me, like a two or three page proposal. So be thinking about that. And maybe in this introductory time, um, Dr. Arnold is also going to give an announcement about um, putting forth a question as well. Sure. Um, yes, just one thing that I had, Dr. Gaberman and I had discussed as kind of a, um, an assignment that we're going to give. It'll be basic, it'll be for next week. So really before the next lecture, which is on Thursday, uh, we would be asking you to work through this assignment. And I will put this as well up on the website. Uh, you'll see this right after the lecture. It'll be listed there as homework for your next week's assignment. But this is kind of a small project uh, that we would be asking you to give us some specific questions from the course. Okay? So you would have an active part of writing out at least two written questions. And it's really, it's a homework assignment. It's an essay. Uh, we're asking really a paragraph or more per question. So these are, these are thought out questions. These are questions with data and good reasoning. And these would be a, a submitted next or for this next lecture on Thursday. Um, and the reason you're doing that is we want first to get your questions because that would set the agenda for our discussion in the last lecture. So uh, by your doing it that this way, I think we'll be able to maximize the time, the quality of the time that we spend. And I'm, I'm po posting in here to chat right now, uh, the written form of what I just said and what you'll see up on the website. Another piece of this though, is that we want you to articulate really well thought out questions, uh, which you guys have asked excellent questions uh, in the lectures up to this point. Very appreciative of those. So this is kind of another, another opportunity to do that, uh, to write out some well articulated reason through questions. And uh, here's the, the rationale is the process of thinking carefully through a question is sometimes as much a critical thinking skill as articulating the answer. So that I think the process of your articulating these questions, you're asking these questions will cause you to have to engage with some of the things that we've worked through in this course. What could these questions be? These questions could be from any, que any discussion we've had, any lecture throughout the entire course, even an area of the course that you hoped we would get to and we did not get to, and you would like to fill that out. But we really are asking for at least a solid paragraph, two questions, uh, so two solid paragraphs or several paragraphs if you want per question well thought out questions. And then these will be things that in our last lecture, uh, we'll, we will work through and be able to answer those. And yet one more benefit by your submitting them before Thursday's lecture gives Dr. Oberlin and I time to really work through and give you some, some quality answers back, uh, which will be a little higher quality than if we're just doing it off the top of our minds right away. So, okay, just so you have that heads up, uh, if you're able to work on that for Thursday's lecture. That's great. <clears throat> That's going to be very uh, powerful for being able to recap and be able to go back through that material. It also gives you an opportunity to go back and do some review. And we want these questions by this Thursday for Thursday's class. So if you can think about this this week and come up with those questions, that would be very helpful for us. 
Okay, we're going to go ahead and jump right back into um, our lecture. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, ask we'll ask for the Lord's blessing and acknowledge Him in what we're doing. Father, we pray that today you would help us with these things um, as we think through these ideas, and um, as Dr. Arnold uh, leads us in this discussion and and guides us along this topic. We pray that you give Him wisdom. And we do thank you so much for these students that are watching this and those who watch it even uh, recorded. Pray that you bless them and allow them to gain much from it. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Indeed, we are, Dr. Everyone and I would say the same thing, very grateful for all of you and your very diligent work. This has been a lot of work, uh, and we really appreciate your efforts and your interest, your love for God's word that is exhibited in your working through this information. It's, it's a delight to be able to convey and talk about these things together with you. So thank you even for the fellowship that we enjoy together around these beautiful, beautiful truths. Um, I just saw one question here that I'll answer quickly. Doc, uh, Mr. John Glass asking, where would you post the questions? And that would just be posted at the top of the Moodle page. There's a main course forum and you would just post those in there. Um, I am really, very excited and <laughs> delighted to uh, have this topic and get to talk about it with you all tonight. And it's the topic of Jesus Christ as the center. I'm posting, or I've just put up for you there, uh, the notes, and that's as a doc or a Word doc. And then also, I will also put in here a PDF if that's a little bit easier for you. Uh, of course, the first link, the one at the top, is the one that will let you edit. So if you want to put your notes within it, that's great. Or the second one will be kind of the, the simpler to open, uh, maybe if you're on a phone or something like that, that document would definitely open. So this is what we'll be working through today. And I want to start out to just, uh, by just kind of introducing um, the concept itself. So let's, let's go to the notes and starting out at the beginning, uh, talking about what we even mean by a center or what even is the concept of a center. So this idea of a center is really, it's quite old. Um, it's kind of a little bit more common, honestly, in the discussion of uh, Old Testament theology. So the Old Testament side, more than the New Testament side, where in the Old Testament side, there was a lot of discussion of what was called the Nitte, which is like the German uh, word for center. And um, I apologize to anyone on here who speaks German, because I'm sure I said that wrong. But the the that gives you a little bit of a clue to the nature of how this discussion went. Uh, that this discussion happened mostly in a liberal context. And so you had a lot of discussion of the center, the, the core of Old Testament theology. In some cases, people that were saying something like, let's cut through all the layers of all the things that got stacked onto Old Testament theology, Old Testament, the Old Testament corpus, the Old Testament documents. Let's get down to the heart let's get down to the kind of the real Old Testament or the stuff that is really at the core and get around all this extra stuff that other theologians added to our canon is what they're saying. These are very liberal ideas. Not everyone, but I would say the majority of those who were discussing this. One of the things that happened with this, uh, somewhat similar to the search for the historical Jesus, if you're familiar with that, the end of the search for the historical Jesus, one writer says, Basically, everyone is looking down into a well, and at the bottom of the well, they're seeing a face reflected back. Okay, the, the metaphor of a well, because it's dark and it's a long ways away, they see a face reflected back at them, and they say, this, I have found the historical Jesus. I have found who the real Jesus actually was and what he actually taught. And, and then, basically, this writer says, what they actually found at the bottom of this well was their own face reflecting back at them. So that whatever they thought was important, whatever they thought was a high concern, that's what they gave as the historical Jesus. Okay, to some extent, a similar thing can happen to us or has happened to people with discussions of the center of the Bible. That basically whatever is important to them, let's say for instance, uh, one very famous uh, theologian in, in liberation theology argues that then the center or the core event of the Old Testament of the Bible at large is the Exodus and that deliverance or freedom, like in the case of the Exodus, is kind of the center and the core of the whole Bible. 
because he wants to go on and say, not so much salvation, but deliverance from oppression. Okay. So what you actually can discover is that this can get a little, this a little bit, um, this can get a little bit confusing when people are just putting back into the, the, their conclusions the things they already want to be true. Here's the form of that, and I'm starting at the top of the page now here where it says, what is the center of the New Testament? Many writers deny even the idea of a legitimate biblical theology and of any unifying idea or ideas because, and this is the kind of the critical part of this, they reject the essential unity of the biblical documents themselves. And so the idea of a unity in the canon presumes or implies on some level the existence of a single mind and unified coherent truth. We've said this before uh, if you go back into previous lectures. So one given is that we cannot believe the documents have unity unless we believe the documents are themselves true. But that goes even deeper in fundamental bibliology because we believe that scripture is written as communication and it is intelligible. Okay, this would be not so much the inspiration side of it. This would be the perspicuity side of it, or that God has spoken and he spoke for us to understand. It is written to be sensible. It must have unity and it must have progression and structure. Um, so the, the idea of this is to say, when I say something like a center, and we're going to talk about the center of the Bible. What we mean by that, basically we're asking, I'll say this in kind of terms that are a little bit too oversimplistic, but still okay. We're talking about essentially a theme. And by that, I think it, it does imply that there has to be a certain logic to the canon. There has to be a certain logic to the text. That's the only way that this, this, would, would, this document, this book would make sense coming from God, doctrine of perspicuity. And that in some way implies that there is some, some unity and some uh, coherence that brings a theme. It's valid to speak of a theme. Finally, we believe that scripture is sufficient for all of life. So we should expect it to be broad and profoundly complex. We should hardly expect an obvious and banal single idea in a direct tree-like relationship to every other concept. And what I, I mean by that, um, I'll talk about in a little bit later on, but if you think of like a simple family tree, and you have the person at the top and then you have the branches coming down, okay? I don't think you would expect to discover that the themes of the Bible are quite that simple. You just have a tree like family tree, one or two, three or four, and that each one breaks down into each little. I don't think it's going to be that simple just because scripture itself is speaking to all of life and it's going to be very broad and profoundly complex. This is a book that discusses and interprets all of life creation and even eternity itself. So expect it to be complex, but do also expect it to be unified and to have a single theme or a single flow of thought. And that brings us here to this. Why should there be a center in the first place? Okay, in a little bit, I'll talk about defining a little better what I mean by a center for now. If you want to just replace the word with the word center with theme. So if you want to read that, why should there be a theme? Okay. Why is there or why should there be a center, a theme in the first place? Is it possible to understand scripture without looking for a center? Is it possible that we would be better off if we didn't search for one? And maybe I'm wasting my time with the lecture. We can acknowledge that it is quite possible, if not likely, that our pursuit of a center could distort the theological task. And I mean by that, that if, if, it's, if, if we go into this process with some wrong ideas about how we assume the theme must work or how we assume the document must be put together, we, we might actually distort what scripture tells us. Simplicity is easier to understand than complexity, and it does gain a hold on our thinking, okay? So we, we have, uh, or I'll read this next sentence first, uncomplicated coherence has a persuasive and even logical appeal. And what I mean by this, um, this is a discussion that happens sometimes in politics. The, very often in politics, the idea that gets the most traction, the idea that people jump on, yes, I like that, and I'll vote for this guy may or may not be the most thoughtful idea in the world. 
And it's because simple ideas, simple explanations. I know how to fix this problem in politics. Somebody just throws out this idea. Simple explanations are easier to understand and therefore they have more of an appeal than complex ones. And as a human then, I have this tendency, this kind of prefer very, very simple explanations that might distort the way I work with the biblical information that I might prefer a really simple theme that kind of I feel like pulls everything together and it might not be accurate to the information that's there. So I ought to be careful. I ought to at least go into this process with care. Both of these things, what I just said, simplicity, coherence, can turn quickly into reductionism and oversimplifying and the temptation to ignore data that falls outside of our expectations. A um, little comment here as I go by. <laughs> as you read the discussions of themes or the attempt to find a center for the entire Bible or for the Old Testament in particular, there's, a, there's one piece that everybody struggles with. Everybody struggles with the wisdom books. The wisdom books kind of don't fit anywhere easily. Okay? And, and there are lots of other things like this as I work with the data. It might be tempting for me to just cut out pieces of the data, right? Um, the comment from, I should remember the name, but I don't, but the comment from uh, one writer that says uh, regarding, this is regarding Calvinism and Arminianism, and he says, uh, there's probably not one writer or reader, theologian, who would not have certain verses he prefers to take out of the canon, who, if he had been sitting there with Paul, while Paul is writing one of his epistles, Paul comes to a certain statement and, and we would all be tempted to reach over and go, oh, actually, don't word it that way. That's going to be confusing to them. But what you're actually dealing with is the word of Almighty God. Okay? So you should never want to remove a word from it. And our temptation here is to do a similar thing. We, because we would like to see coherence, we might be tempted to ignore or omit data information that falls outside of our expectations as we're going through this process. So at a minimum, I'd say this, any search for a center should be guarded by humility and intellectual honesty. We have to do this, it's warranted, but it does bring real perils. Uh, second, I would say this, the search for a center is also in some manner unavoidable. What I just said, point one was kind of be careful, you might get yourself into trouble. Point two, I don't think you can avoid it really. Okay, you are going to have to deal with this, with this idea. You're going to have to deal with the center. And why I mean by this, if we attempt to understand any body of information as true, not just as kind of, uh, well, this is literature, but as true, as it's actually telling us truth, then we automatically assume coherent meaning. We automatically assume that all the pieces fit together in some way. And all of those, the result is a body of propositions or truth claims. And, and whatever then our views on truth, we cannot ignore that. That by reading a document and believing it's true, you are implying or assuming that it is coherent. It does fit together. But putting those together means that in effect, you cannot avoid having a center. If, if you read the Bible as a coherent book, it all fits together, then you cannot avoid the fact that there has to be kind of an, a structure to it, an inherent structure. It fits together in some way, as such implying in some way that I'll explain in a little bit, a theme, a center, an organization. And my argument here would be that we will either do this process self-consciously, self-consciously or haphazardly, in other words, we can define our center well, or we can define our center poorly. But if we want to study the text at all, not having a center is not a valid choice, right? You can either think about what you're doing and actually what we're gonna to do tonight, work through a process of coming to your conclusion about the theme, or you can just pretend that you're ignoring the problem, in which case you'll do a bad job but either way, you are implying a theme because you are reading it coherently. You are reading it as a book that fits together. It's not just random scattered comments. It's one mind, it's one truth. That would lead me to the third thing here. Defining our center is a self-conscious choice to identify biblical theological categories before systematic ones. 
And um, the, the idea here is that really everybody basically organizes somehow. They, they do it, maybe they do it mentally, consciously, maybe they don't even realize they're doing it, but we're all organizing when we text. Our mind is trying to put the pieces together. So we, when we're doing that process, we might, we might prefer or it, we might find it easier to go for a systematic theology scheme because it feels really smooth, right? Okay, doctrine of God and then Christology, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and then you can do anthropology, homardiology, doctrine of sin, go to soteriology, ecclesiology, eschatology. I mean, it has a really nice flow to it, right? And so the, that at least following those familiar categories feels it, feels, it feels clear to us. And I would say that's not a problem. Okay? The traditional systematic categories have their benefit. We're planning to do a systematic theology course. So this kind of thing has its clear benefit. But I would also suggest at the same time, or probably simultaneous, we are better served to use a scheme that remains closer to the text. While you can have the systematic side, have a scheme, an organization that follows the outlines or the, we could even say the topography of the text itself. That if we reserve, observe repeated concepts, strongly emphasized ideas, propositions that become the interpretive grid for other propositions, there will be a certain group of core themes that will naturally emerge, core ideas that just come up over and over again. And these themes will have, if you pull out those themes, they will have interrelationships. Those themes will build on one another. Those themes will ultimately fit together into a whole network of ideas. So kind of building on what I said before, you're going to have to, you're, you're going to have this in your mind. You either do it well or you don't do it at all. Excuse me, either do it well or you do it poorly. You can't not do it. Since you're going to have to do it anyway, or you will do it, you might as well, or you should, think in biblical theology categories that arise from the text naturally to control, organize, and interpret this grid. To say it differently, and now I'll try to, I'll try to say what I've been saying, basically, with a kind of a metaphor. Um, saying this metaphorically, there is a benefit in that to enjoy the that emerges from the biblical text. Okay, so if you think about uh, if you think about looking across the whole framework of the entire biblical text, there's think of it like a fabric, okay, and you get a certain benefit in stepping back to look at that whole fabric, that whole picture. Uh, there is benefit in observing that big picture, the whole picture. There is also benefit in observing the individual threads that make up that fabric. So if the whole thing is a huge tapestry, there are threads that go through that tapestry. Observe the individual threads, observe the strands that they connect and overlap with, and observe the internal organization of the entire tapestry. And in the process, you're going to find certain themes that stand out more than others. You'll discover once you get up close and you look at that fabric closely, there are certain threads that carry through that are repeated over and over and again in a way that stands out and is worth paying attention to. There, are a, there will be a small group of themes that form the core structure. There will be a group of themes that actually nearly paramount to hold the entire fabric together. Okay? So that group of themes or observing that way would be core to your really understanding the tapestry and the fabric itself. I'm going to pause here quickly and read a question here. Can't we acknowledge that God speaks to different people in different manners and for different purposes? Not everything has been revealed, so how can we expect to see all, all see the same themes? We should instead embrace different points of view, so long as the testimonies are true. I agree with that, I do. Um, and I will come later to the idea that there are multiple ways to observe the data or to work through. I'm going to argue two things, though, here to push back a little bit. Number one, uh, with any discussion, let's say we're going to do this in systematic theology, your context, or your background, other details like that, the questions you're bringing to the page, those questions are going to shape the way that you proceed, particularly practical theology, right? So it will affect the way that you work with the text. We would all confess, though, that there is a certain or a fundamental foundationalism or there is a certain objectivity in the truth claims of the text. In other words, in, as we work with the text, there are certain things that are going to differ 
subjectively between persons, cultures, time, and so forth. So that one person will bring different questions to the text than the other. But we, we ought to, we have to confess that there are absolutes that do not shift according to those constraints. And I, we would all agree on that. Um, going further though, as that they, this is in your epistemology, it would be called chase and foundationalism. As our viewpoint in that, we should maintain that the weight, actually the overwhelming weight of information in the biblical text is in the subjective category, right? The overwhelming weight would be. And I'll take one more point. That was kind of my first point. My second point would be this. If you remember the pyramid, the stack of disciplines, okay, so it goes up from exegesis all the way up to the top, which is practical theology. This is not absolute. There is subjectivity all the way down the whole stack. But the further you go up that stack, generally, the further you go up that stack, the more your subjectivity enters into the discussion, okay? Biblical theology is the handmaiden of exegesis or the next step on exegesis. And I would argue then that biblical theology will have a great deal of objectivity to it. Meaning, yes, you're right, that we will have some differences in how we observe themes, but I want to argue pretty strenuously that there are some themes that are the right themes. <laughs> and there are some themes that are the wrong themes. In other words, I don't think you can come to the Bible and say, I think the theme of the Bible is clothing, right? Clothing that you can track, there's a biblical theology, you can track all the way from the Garden of Eden, all the way to the white garments that are given to the saints in Revelation. But I, I think I can say pretty definitively that is not the theme of the Bible. I can say pretty definitively that is not a major theme of the Bible. It's a theme, that's fine, but it is not a major theme of the Bible. So I think we come to a point where we want to argue that the, there's a set of themes that are the core and that that is objective. And uh, last, I said I would give two, but I'll give three. I would say that when you're coming to something fundamentally basic as the core theme or the set of themes at the height, the top of the list, I think I want to argue that that's pretty objective. I want to argue that that's, it's, it's not per se just a matter of different viewpoints. There is some subjectivity that kicks in. I will explain that, and I, we have that in the notes here. But I want to, object that, I want to argue that there is an objective uh, set that gets, gets us there. Okay. Um, keep on going here. Uh, oh, well, and here you go. Uh, fourth, it is entirely possible that what stands at the center is not a single idea, but several ideas. Okay, and um, we'll explain this in a little bit later, but maybe instead of speaking of the, the theme of the Bible, maybe we should speak of themes of the Bible in the plural, meaning we kind of have a constellation, kind of a group that stands at the core, maybe three or four that together at the core are at the heart and then the others radiate outwards from it. Uh, no one has been able thus far to definitively and conclusively demonstrate one center for either testament. And I'm not going to <laughs> conclusively demonstrate that tonight for sure. Uh, one center for either testament, all the more for the entire canon. I will tonight make my argument, but you know, no one has yet proven this so well that the other scholars have said, okay, problem solved. Let's move on. And, and, there are different reasons for that. Um, I'll talk about those in just a second, but there is some subjectivity in some cases that is valid and there is some subjectivity that is not. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. As a result, the trend for recent biblical theology has been to search for a cluster of central ideas to organize biblical theological themes in a network rather than in a hierarchy. Um, if you're interested in this idea, it's kind of fascinating, but you can do a thing where uh, you start thinking about themes uh, or you start thinking about categorizing information, not so much in a tree, but categorizing information as a network, kind of a constellation of ideas. Uh, this first hit me or I first came across this idea when I was working on a, um, it was, I was listening to a TED talk. Okay. So this is really pretty distant from just a straight um, like theology context. And this person was going through kind of a history of um, the way that different ideas have been communicated. And he pointed out that for a long period of time, people assumed information had to be communicated, something like this, where you would have, uh, you know, your one at the top and then several below, and then you're gonna have a few below that. And so each one of these is going to be kind of a hierarchical arrangement, like a family tree. So this can go back way, way back in the history of human ideas. 
Um, and, and you can see where this, this has had a, sol a very strong influence on the way that we think a lot about a lot of things. Okay? So that's an interesting concept. The argument he made was that in recent times, the trend or what we've kind of learned about ourselves is that there might actually be a benefit instead of thinking strictly tree-like, hierarchical, it might be profitable for us to think of ideas as kind of a general network. You have lots of ideas scattered all about, and these ideas are connected to each, other's, to each other in significant, meaningful ways. Okay, so as you then think about the relationship of ideas, you're categorizing which ideas are connected to which other ideas. Okay, and it's kind of like if you think of the internet, the internet you know, where is the internet based? Right, where is the core idea of the internet or the core base of the internet? And the answer is everywhere, right? There is no one place that that's where the internet lives. The internet lives all over the place, okay? Now, you can still identify certain regions, okay? New York is a major region, data region. Uh, Singapore is a major data region. You have places where the, the pipe, Hong Kong is another one, London is another one, where the pipes kind of come together. And so in that place, there's a hub. So you have big ones, and you have littler ones, okay? but there is not a single, single core. And so the question that people are asking here or the discussion that we could have here essentially would be, which one is the, the, the discussion or the theme of the Bible, the themes of the Bible, which one are they more like? Is it more hierarchical? Is it more like a network? How do they relate? And I think it's quite valid to search for a cluster of ideas and to organize them in a network like this rather than a hierarchy. Uh, this seems to be a valid way, method, and contribute to more careful interaction with biblical themes. Um, and I would argue here, while I, above in these arguments, I argue that there is a, uh, there is a theme, or I should say, there's a core, okay? The arguments I made above do not per se require that there is one theme. There could be multiple themes, okay? I just argued above that there is a core, that it's not just a scattered mess of ideas, but that there is a core. So it is completely possible that the internal organization of biblical thought is more complex, that it looks more like my network over here and less like my hierarchy. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Brother Joseph Ng, that's interesting. I, the wording uneven canon I would shy away from because that's going to, um, there's, there's a word, there's a phrase that goes around canon within a canon. And it's the, the idea of a canon within a canon is that some people uh, have essentially created certain books that they treat as more important than other books in a way that probably violates our doctrine of canonicity. So these are like the really, really important books you have to read and these other ones are just whatever. So I don't want to do that. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Um, however, what you said here is right in a sense. Some books more hubbish than others. Uh, I can sign up for that. Um, there, well, I, I don't want to go too far here, but one of the principles that underlies Google is that they pay attention to um, websites that are often referenced by other websites because that tells you something important is going on there. There's something really big about that one. Okay, kind of my network idea over here. That's information technology discussion, not necessarily related here, except it's kind of fascinating to pay attention to the fact that the New Testament puts a huge amount of emphasis in referencing Daniel and particularly like Daniel 7 or Psalm 110 or Psalm 2 or the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, there are, these, there are these hub passages that the New Testament references so overwhelmingly, it really leaves you with a sense, wow, let me go back and see what was going on there, because something big is there, right? And, and the same thing with concepts, that you could do this thematically or conceptually and say, this certain concept or idea just seems to come up all the time. What is this? Where is it coming from? Why, why so important? And I think that's a very, uh, very valid way to look at it. Good. Seems like God's creation is also a very complex network. Good. I'm, I'm going to argue that there are multiple ways for us to organize or represent information. I do think the network way of doing it is probably a superior way, to the simple tree-like way of doing it. Okay. Uh, coming back here to our notes, examples of proposed centers. So here's some kind of some ideas that have been passed around as centers or themes. And you know, there is, not I know of, 
uh, not a place that I found, I've come across that just gives you, okay, here are you know, all the centers for all time. To some extent, even the way of saying it is a center theme, et cetera, like that, is kind of a more recent concern. And furthermore, different people are looking for different things. Okay, so I kind of did the best I could here. I just pulled out some ideas. Primarily, I, I used three or four resources here, but then I also went through a big stack of books, which I forgot to bring in here. I want to show you later if we have time. A big stack of books, and I just threw each one, probably 10, 15 books, tried to find what they were giving as the theme or as the center. Okay, so let's look at some of those. Um, here, uh, Number one, um, here's a proposal that has been given James Walter. I don't, at this, I put this in here because I think it gives you a, a sense of what, what is not terribly helpful. <laughs> he suggests 13 ideas, captivity and deliverance, God and the son of God, gift of Torah, covenant, people of God, the cultus, by me, which means like the temple, the sacrifice, and so forth. Kingship, creation, wisdom, spirit of God, righteousness, and justice, day of the Lord, promise, hope. Okay, so those are some interesting themes to kind of follow through. I think what this shows you a little bit though is I have trouble wrapping my head around 13 things, right? I look down the list and I'm kind of, I'm a little bit, I'm left kind of scratching my head trying to figure out how to even put that together in a, a full comprehensible way. Other proposals that have gone around include covenant. These are more from a liberal viewpoint. Uh, also God in Christ, Yahweh, divine holiness, lordship, kingship, divine presence, Existential reality, okay, we're getting several steps removed from the biblical text now. Communion, hope, and God who acts. Uh, and I apologize there, this would be for um, done. Um, or I'm sorry, right. Here's, a, here's uh, an interesting way, I guess, to kind of pursue or think about those. Um, so you have the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology. Uh, that's this here. And uh, this is a really helpful resource. I highly recommend it. Um, they have a first section where they go through each one of the books, Old Testament and New Testament, and they have a second section where they go through themes, and they will list out a whole bunch of different topics and trace that theme. Clothes, that I mentioned earlier, is one of those themes, for instance. So it's pretty broad. Um, they give a list of themes that have been proposed by other thinkers, including monotheism, God's covenant faithfulness, God's reign, righteousness, the covenants, election, grace, the response of obedience, the people of God, exodus and the new exodus, creation and new creation, sin and salvation. Also multiplex solutions, by which we mean things, multiple ideas at the core, uh, the existence of God, God is creator of a good world, the fall of humanity, or the fact of election. I will do this now because, uh, I don't know, if it's now as good as any other time. Um, to talk about from the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology, something I worked on. Um, and here, here's basically what I did here. Um, I took the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology, I took their topics. Okay, so if you open up the, uh, their, if you open up their, their resource, on the side here, you're going to see a list, huge list of um, specific topics that they cover here. Okay. And all of these topics here, it's like a library of topics. I mean, all the way to Aaron, Babel, Adam and Eve, adoption, adultery. It's a long, long, long list of topics. It's a dictionary. So out of this big dictionary thing that you have um, and all that list of topics, I wanted to see if there were any patterns that were going to emerge. So what I ended up doing, I entered all of those themes here into uh, this document. And it's not without just you're looking at it right now, it's probably not going to be terribly helpful for you. What I'll do is I'll put a link out for you if you want to look at it further. Um, but I put all the topics in here first. Okay, so if we zoom in for one instance on just one thing over here, you could come down on this theme, the people of God, zoning in on that theme, the church, and then you would have a list of themes over here, baptism, tongues, apostle, Gentiles, last supper, minister, ministry, new covenant, Pentecost. You could do just the same thing with temple underneath which you would see the law, prophets, prophecy, feast, temple, land. You could do the same thing with God uh, and you could see his actions, his attributes, compassion, favor. 
Each one of these things that you're seeing here represents an article in the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology. Those are all, there's an article for every one of those. If you see something with um, uh, brackets on it, that means I added it, okay? I came up with the category. Uh, but if it has no brackets, there is an article in the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology. And so kind of what I was trying to do here was kind of a coming up from below attempt at trying to understand or get an idea in my head of what is going on with all these themes, okay? Whether that's a valid method or not, um, it's, I don't know. I, I wouldn't argue that it's the method to do it or something, but it was kind of a way that I, I worked with to try to get some ideas in my mind, okay? Just to try to prepare for this lecture. And what I'm doing right now, I'll upload that here. And if you wanna play with that uh, resource, I'm gonna send you the link here. So you can take a look at that on your own time and just kind of see what you think uh, as you work with that resource. Okay, so um, just a brief moment here while I copy that out. Okay, so that's one, one method you could do as kind of a way, and there's the link there if you want it, as a way to kind of see what you think is going on with all of these themes. Um, something that was interesting to me about the, uh, the way that that happened as I was working with that resource I had this massive, huge amount of information, right? I mean, just, just all of these references, it, all of these car articles, it's too much to wrap your head around. So if I just had the list, I cannot even comprehend what's going on there. And so in order for me to try to understand it, I started putting it into categories. Okay, here's a bunch of things with evil, sin, curse, okay, Satan. So I started putting those into those categories. Same thing up here, humanity. Right? You have a whole bunch of things that have to do with humanity, biblical history, God and his person, and so forth. Think about what I was doing there, though. As soon as I started organizing it, I basically was more or less doing a form of biblical theology, or excuse me, systematic theology, right? As soon as I started organizing it that way, I was kind of creating my own category for how to understand these pieces of information, that were given to me by the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology that probably on some level represent biblical emphases and emphasis, biblical themes. So I think what you discover is as soon as you start organizing, which you can't help doing, as a human you will do that, as soon as you start organizing, your mind starts to go that direction and you have started doing what I'm talking about. You're trying to find a, an organized way of understanding the themes. You're trying to put them together in a way that makes sense for you. Okay? So, uh, yes, Brother uh, Kenneth Chung, you, you end up kind of adding categories, uh, end up adding extra biblical categories in order to try to understand the biblical data itself. And it's pretty much inevitable that that's going to happen to you. Okay, back to our uh, discussion that we were having there with some of the themes uh, and walking through those themes. Uh, that's the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology. More to the center of evangelical viewpoints. Kaiser points to promise and fulfillment. Okay, these are these are people that we now are more sympathetic with. Promise and fulfillment. That's kind of coming more from a um, an Old Testament direction. Okay? Others speak of salvation history or a salvation history grid. Lad, who is a New Testament guy highlights the divine mission for the world, including the context, the center, the community, the people of God, the climax. Schreiner speaks of the coming of Jesus Christ and the work of the spirit as fundamental for fulfilling God's promises. Marshall speaks of mission. All of these guys basically are New Testament guys. Marshall speaks of mission, both Jesus' mission to inaugurate the kingdom of God, and then Jesus' followers coming to proclaim him and call people to faith. Thielman describes five poles, okay, or five different, um, directions, things that it, 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 now, that it uh, orbits around. The significance of Jesus, faith is a response to Jesus, the outpouring of God's spirit, the church is God's people, and the consummation of all things. Thielman concludes by describing the centrality of Christ to the theological vision of the New Testament. Okay, so you've got some variety between people that we agree with. And here are some more conservatives. This is on the Old Testament side. Speaking of sovereignty, God's reign, that's Merrill. Pain points to salvation, graciously received through faith in the righteous life, substitutionary death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Waltke proposes Israel's sublime God, 
whose attributes hold intention, his holiness and mercy. He glorifies himself by establishing his, establishing his universal rule over his volitional creatures on earth through Jesus Christ and his covenant people. Encapsulated in these words, a little simpler to get your head around, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Walkie later summarizes, borrowing from Ikra, the eruption, okay, uh, similar to, it's um, slightly different, but similar to like erupting like a volcano of the holy God's merciful kingship. Okay? But in this case, it's, it's coming in, his kingdom coming in, okay? his kingdom entering into the world. So slightly a different idea from the metaphor I just gave, but still close enough. Breaking in, the breaking in of the kingdom. Uh, working with the entire text as a biblical theology. You know, so these first one was New Testament, second was Old Testament. These are guys that do the whole Bible. Schreiner seems to highlight the kingdom of God. Jeremias or Jeremias offers one of the most specific, the relationship of God and Christ in respect to Jesus, calling him Abba, Father. Thurman Wisdom, who was one of my teachers way back, uh, sees it as the redemption and reign of man in the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, the Savior and King. Andrew Nicelli and Jason DeRucci just books, actually they're not even out yet, but I was able to get a, a copy here. And the theme he gave there, really helpful, helpful, very, very clear. God reigns, saves, and satisfies through covenant for his glory in Christ. Okay, he's pulling together maybe five ideas, and he's put the, putting them all together as an attempt at stating, stating a theme. And what I think is notable about what I just read, in the attempt to describe the theme of scripture, these writers are tending to compile or combine an entire group of ideas together. Okay, so... Hardly anybody really will take a single idea as the theme or the core of the entire canon. I, I think validly so, because just to take a single idea, this is it, uh, is, going to, um, is going to probably distort uh, a little bit, not really sufficiently explain your ideas. Okay, um, I'll do this last section and then I think we'll take our break here. Uh, go ahead, feel free. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the chat as we go. Um, so if you have, uh, if you have some ideas here, then definitely hit some questions in here and I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. The comment here earlier about AIG, I think if you search for those, they're, those are helpful. I would say the seven C's of AIG, they're kind of doing a little bit more like major, major events all the way through. And it is distorted a little bit by their particular concern on creation and apologetics. And what I mean by that is, I don't think they're really, with those seven C's, I don't feel like they're really tracing the, the biblical theology side of things so much as they, it's a very helpful way of explaining the gospel to an unbeliever or a person who's not familiar with a biblical story but I don't know so much that I go with it as a biblical theology grid. Um, when I've looked at it before, some of the things they're doing, it's good. It really is very good, but not so much tracing things, you know, something like the Holy Spirit. Okay, you know, these kinds of things are, are major, major ideas that maybe are not gonna crop up in that kind of discussion. It's no problem, I'm not criticizing what they're doing, just it's, it, they're doing a different thing. Okay, um, what is a center? Core to the confusion about what is the center is defining what a center is in the first place. Okay. Um, I would say all these that I just read, I mean, you look at all these, there's a lot of variety in what I just read. So say it this way, how is it that all these people are basically spending their entire lives studying the same book? And when they get to the end, they come up with different conclusions about something so fundamental as the theme of the book. It's the theme of the book, right? I mean, we meant, it seems like we really should be able to agree about the theme of this book, don't you think? Um, I will uh, say this in terms of kind of a personal experience I had at one point. I was taking advanced New Testament theology with Dr. Talbert. The classmates I had, a really intelligent group of guys, just brilliant guys. Brian Collins was one of those guys. Uh, Looking forward to his next, next, next lecture on the land. Don't miss it. It'll, it'll be a very, very helpful information. Um, other guys like that, probably four or five guys in the room that were just brilliant. I mean, I, I, I would at times, I, I would take notes from Dr. Talbert's lectures, and then a guy would ask a question, and I would take notes from his question, right? Because this question, there was, wow, I've never heard of this kind of, uh, some of these things he's discussing, right? 
So that was the group of guys. Dr. Talbert had to be absent at one point. So he said, okay, you guys will have kind of like a seminar or you guys discuss together. So we got together and um, we were asking different questions. At one point I asked and I was embarrassed. I said, so I feel like I should know the answer to this, but you guys help me out here. Um, what is the theme of the Bible? Right? Well, it's such a basic question, right? You feel like, okay, every first year college student should just know the answer to this question or something. Here we're in a doctoral level class. So I expect to be, um, to be grilled or something. And it, the room has got kind of quiet and everybody kind of looks around at each other. And then we ended up spending like an hour and a half discussing that question. What is the theme of the Bible? Which is really striking. What's going on here? Right? Um, and, and you have then all of these different proposals. What is, what is the issue or what is the reason that you have so many different answers to that question? And I think it's probably here. Court of the confusion is defining what we mean. In other words, I say a word theme. I ask that question, what is the theme of the Bible? The big long discussion you have to have first is what do you mean by theme? And if you can tell me what you mean by theme, then I can probably better answer your question. Are we talking about a liter literary theme? Right? In other words, is it it's kind of like um, if I go to certain of the Psalms, the theme is very clear in the Psalm because it's stated several times. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. It happens at the beginning. It happens at the end. Everything in the middle all the way through is kind of explaining that idea. Okay? Or I can give you the theme of in Daniel 2, there is a section where Daniel prays and he praises God for answering him. It's very clear in that that the theme, there's, dual, there's a dual theme there. The dual themes are wisdom and might. God has wisdom, God has might. Because Daniel says both of those things at the beginning, at the end, everything in the middle is about his wisdom and his might. Okay, it's really, really clear. Are we talking about a literary theme? By which I mean something that comes up a lot. Or are we talking about a theological conceptual core? Well, what would that mean? Let's keep on going. Would we identify this theme or this core would we identify it by the number of times it occurs? We just we could just do a head count if you want, right? We could just see what gets said the most. We could do it by its appearance in emphatic and important text. You know, there are certain texts, let's say the book into the book of John. Uh, at the end of the book of John, these things, he's written all these things, okay, so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ. At the end of the God, the first epistle of John, he's written all these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, so those are big, important texts that kind of tell you everything about what the rest of the book was about. Or Ecclesiastes, here is the end of the matter, right? Well, whatever comes next is going to tell you about the rest of the book. Or even if you look at the beginnings and the ends of books, which actually we'll do a little later on, some of that can be revelatory. Okay? So is it something like that? Should we do it by some other standard? Should we um, seek an idea that all of the others use as an interpretive lens? Okay, there are certain concepts that become kind of a way of interpreting or understanding the other concepts. Maybe that's what we're looking for. Conceptually, is this core idea important by its connection to a large number of other ideas? Okay, so um, I guess maybe I deleted. No, I didn't. If you go back to my network that I had here earlier, okay, if you think about the network that I gave you, I, I put up, you know, five or six different concepts. Okay. Well, in those five or six concepts that are there, there might be a certain concept that kind of stands at the center of some of the other concepts. So to reorganize my chart a little bit, what if instead, you know, I ended up all of the different pieces connect to this piece, okay? This is the only piece that has connections from everybody else, right? Well, then he, right here, he is probably really important because everybody else has a connection to him. Is it that, or could we even measure the strength of the connections by which I mean, let's say this idea has a really, really strong tie to him. This idea has a really, really strong tie. This has a moderately strong tie. This has a moderately strong tie. Well, then that also would be a way of telling me that he is a core idea, the strength of the connections. Or I didn't do this, but if we drew different size circles, in other words, if I have like five ideas that are really huge, and I have 20 ideas that are kind of smaller, and then those five ideas all connect to one idea, right? Then that one idea is probably it. 
do we measure it like that? I mean, all I'm doing here really is trying to show us when I say what is the theme, I'm actually asking an extremely complicated question. Is the structure of concepts a network or a hierarchy? This is what I did earlier, the tree, or is it a network? Does a single idea or does a group of ideas stand at the center? If several ideas, this is where the several ideas gets a little dicey. If the several ideas stand at the center, how many? How would we define how many? How do you support your decision? What criteria would we use for choosing out those key concepts? How do you say three and not five, not 12, not 38, right? I mean, how do you know how many to do? How should we know what the center is? Should we prioritize exegesis, biblical theology, or systematic? And I put, for instance, union with Christ. I think union with Christ is an immensely important idea, and it, it definitely has some strong biblical theology connections or even exegetical connections. I think probably union with Christ on some level gets highlighted even more once you bring in systematic theology, because then it becomes the basis for things like imputation, where the text itself doesn't so much clearly emphasize it per se. Systematically speaking, it's a really important tie. Okay, so uh, something like union with Christ seems important if you keep systematic in the back of your brain. Whereas some other things like, I don't know, let's say for instance, um, definitely Messiah, okay? Because of the Christ coming in the New Testament. Messiah seems a little bigger if you keep exegesis in the back of your brain. And the last question here to ask, should we have New Testament priority because it is the end point of revelation? Should the Old Testament be interpreted through the lens of the new? That's a, that sounds pretty obvious, but it's, it's a hard question. Because you, you recognize if you go through the Old Testament and you interpret every passage with the knowledge of what's coming in the New Testament, you have essentially flattened out progressive revelation. In other words, Eve doesn't know the name Jesus, right? So you, you, you wouldn't want to say, for instance, so, and so um, Abel was a believer because he believed in Jesus. Abel doesn't know the name Jesus. If you walk up to Abel and say, do you believe in Jesus? Have you confessed your sins and asked him to forgive you because he died on the cross? Abel has no idea what you're talking about, right? So does Abraham. They have no idea what you mean. If you say something like the seed, then they're going, oh, tell me more. I <laughs> think that's the reaction. Tell me more. <laughs> so do we interpret the Old Testament or how much do we interpret the Old Testament through the lens of the new? That's part of what defines whether or not I will conclude that one or another thing is the theme. Okay, well, let's take a five minute break. Uh, during the five minute break, I'm just going to sit here and um, answer any questions that come up. So please feel free, feel free to ask questions. We'll be back in five minutes at 9.06 by my time, or we'll just say something 06 wherever you are. Dr. Oberlin, any, uh, anything you wanna add here? No, that's that's great. I'm, I'm watching this, this is uh, fascinating. I love your mind node. And you're um, whipping things around here on the on the screen. It's great. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Well, see everyone at, again in about uh, six minutes. Then, thank you.
Okay. I'm uh, I'm ready to jump back in because we just have we just have only so much time. Um, what I showed you here, or what I pasted in uh, here again, was something that I had done. I've shown you shown it to you before. Uh, it's it's kind of my effort to graphically represent an email I had with Dr. Collins. Um, I think if I did this again, I would probably do it a little differently. Uh, but anyway, you can you can take a look at it if you want. I posted pasted it in there. I'd say the main benefit for you is probably to kind of see some of the themes that are big. Okay, so some of the big ideas of uh, the entire Bible just represented there graphically. And anyway, it gives you kind of some ideas. Um, I'll show you one more in just a second, and that that will continue on with uh, some of the things that I was saying here. Okay, so uh, one more here that I want to show you is actually taken from, um, excuse me, just a second. Uh, actually, this is taken from a, a another study I did, and that was working with the Zondervan, what do they call it, the Zondervan, the new Zondervan study Bible. Okay, so the Zondervan Study Bible edited by uh, D.A. Carson, which I've worked with some, uh, not as much as I would like to. It seems to be a really good resource. What I've done with it so far, I've really, I've definitely enjoyed. And uh, they had a little project, they had a pro significant project here um, where they worked with different essays and came up with 25 different themes. And those 25 themes were their representing uh, or there were for use for essays. So they wrote 25 themes on these 25, uh, 25 essays on these 25 themes. Um, I took those themes and just as a way for me to try to understand what was going on and try to get my head wrapped around it all, I put those themes here on this page. Okay, so um, the themes that they gave were sin, fall, creation, holiness, justice, law, wrath, covenant, sacrifice, temple, priest, prophets, prophecy, exile, exodus, love, grace, gospel, wisdom, the city of God, the kingdom of God, the people of God, sonship, mission, worship, shalom, consummation, death, resurrection, and the glory of God. This I will give to you as an image, and I'll just paste this in a little bit, late, a little bit later. All of the organization, the way they had it originally was strictly and simply just that they listed these things, 1 to 25. So I put these things in here, and I wanted to try to understand what was going on. It just kind of as a side note before I keep on going, um, I tried first to do them in that other program that you saw earlier. And I did it that way because uh, I thought, okay, I'll do this tree kind of. That's a tree hierarchy method, the other one that I saw. And it won't work. You have to do it like this. It won't work. Okay, I couldn't get anywhere. So I think that kind of highlights what I was saying here a little bit ago, that you really end up having a network kind of method of working with these different themes. And when I put those things together, I think definitely standing at the fall is sin and the creation. I put the fall, that's my, anything that's not in a blue box, I added. But connecting those two, those I think definitely fit together. There's definitely a line that goes downward from sin. God's holiness, his justice. I probably could have put these two together, like maybe a side-by-side -side kind of idea. Um, so you could... Uh, you can maybe organize these uh, differently if you wanted, maybe put holiness over to the side like that, but whatever. Uh, holiness, justice, law, and wrath, those four things together all lead down to the gospel. In the answer to God's holiness, his justice, his wrath through his law is the gospel. And that is in particular connection with his love and his grace. So because of his love and his grace, we can be saved. And that love and that grace allows us then to be the people of God. So moving directly down from sin in spite of sin and this reality of God's holiness, his love and his grace in the gospel allows us to be his people. Kind of a parallel way, though, of presenting some of that on the side here is taking us in more of an Old Testament theology direction. So this is kind of right here. This is representing kind of the New Testament flow of thought honestly. Over here is really representing more of the Old Testament flow, flow of thought. And so you have sacrifice, the temple, the priest. I think those are kind of a group. That's why I put them, why I put them together. Sacrifice, temple, the priest go together. 
in connection to the covenant, which the covenant granted is connected to the law. And that's also connected to prophets, prophecy, the exile, exodus, and all of these things, because of the sacrifices, the prophets and their declarations, and the exile, all of these things point down to these themes again. In other words, the result, if you really accept the sacrifices and the covenant, and you listen to the words of the prophets, then you are the people of God. And all of these things follow as a result, sonship, mission, worship, those things derive from these the people of God, the city of God, the kingdom of God, these I think are a group, I think they stand together. And that group then leads ultimately down here to shalom, consummation, death and resurrection. And ultimately at the end, I put this as a crossbar because the glory of God kind of stretches all the way across the information, the glory of God to the end of the glory of God. Okay, so it's, it, you end up with a complex, honestly, a pretty complex network trying to put all these pieces together, it gets complicated. Okay, and one other piece here, I said wisdom is always an issue for people. Where do you put wisdom? I connect the wisdom here up to creation and connect it over to the gospel. In other words, ultimate wisdom is in the gospel. Wisdom also, that's observing the wisdom books are representing or observing some, some just f some realities of creation, of the way God made the world. Okay, so that's an attempt. It's an, it's an interesting idea of working with it. And um, if you want to, uh, want to work with this, you could feel free. I think this would be a good way um, to do, so, do an exercise, okay? And in the process of working with these boxes, see how you would link these things, try to understand it. Okay, um, so I'll come back over here and continue on with the further with our, our discussion through our notes to try to propose what I would say here. There are no simple answers. What makes these questions pertinent, the questions I asked up here, all of this huge list of questions here about what you would do as your theme, what makes it pertinent is that it stands behind our conclusions on what themes we will highlight. And it is likely that many of these answers are valid as far as they go. In other words, it is possible to view scripture through various lenses that validly highlight various aspects of the story. You know the the metaphor with uh, philosophy, the talk about the elephant. And the metaphor with that is that uh, like, I think four blind men are walking through the forest and they run into an elephant. And so then they get back to the village and somebody says, what is an elephant like? And uh, they start making the explanations. One says an elephant is like a tree. Well, that's because he ran into the, he ran into the foot. An elephant is like a snake. And that's because he grabbed the trunk. An elephant is like a leaf. Well, he touched the, uh, the ear. An elephant is like a rope because well, he grabbed the, the tail. Okay? So in philosophy, they, we say that depending on what part of reality you're looking at, you might come out with pretty different sounding answers and that you might actually be looking at a pretty similar reality. I think a similar thing might be here, that just as we do that with philosophy, we might also discover working with a biblical, multiple different ways of highlighting different parts of this gemstone biblical truth. Just as we might read the text literarily, chronologically, topically, or theologically, there are various ways of arrang arranging the biblical themes that might bring out legitimate insights, and they're, as, they're good as far as they go. Another helpful way is to actually adjust the metaphor instead of searching for a center, look for a chain of ideas, look for several concepts, that progressively lead to the next concept. This idea leads to that idea, leads to that idea and so forth. And that has the advantage of acknowledging progressive revelation or advancing even ideas, even as you acknowledge that they are linked together. So that brings me then to the next part of the discussion, the big kind of the, the thing that we wanna make sure we finish through and that is Jesus Christ as the center, putting these ideas together, taking all of these ideas into account. Um, I saw a couple of questions here and, and maybe not so much questions, but discussion back and forth about how to fit different pieces together. And I think um, some of these here are, uh, some of these are good comments um, and the recognition that there are different ways to link the different boxes together. Um, I think there are some bad ways to link the boxes together, right? The, I think there are probably multiple right answers and then there are some definitely some wrong answers. And then among the right answers, there are probably more right answers and less right answers. In other words, there are probably answers that are a little superior to others. So I, um, 
putting all those things together, I think we can accept that there are different ways to convey the information while there are some wrong ways to convey the information. Okay, um, I'll keep on going here with Jesus Christ as the center. I'm going to argue here a specific center, even though I've, I don't, I don't, we shouldn't have any question or anyway, I think it should be clear by now that I definitely recognize multiple possibilities. We definitely work through a lot of different ideas. So I think that idea we could, we could definitely put away, but I think I still want to argue for a specific center and we'll see what happens here. Um, taking these ideas into account, I would propose Jesus Christ as the center of scripture, both because he is the locus of both testaments and their constant, constant emphasis. Also because he explains, this is important to me, he explains their discontinuity and the other important biblical themes. The Bible is a story in two acts. He stands at the center. Okay, that last sentence, if I wanted you to kind of summarize what I'm going to say to you in this next part, that's it. The Bible is a story in two acts. He stands at the center. There are some advantages to this theme or why I, I feel I want to go this way. It has the advantage of explaining both the continuity and the discontinuity of the Testaments. I'll talk about continuity later when I'm basically going through and trying to prove this theme. But let's talk about discontinuity. That both of the Testaments are expressing either the hope and longing for a future Messiah or the joyful news that he has come. And when you get to the discontinuity side, I, we can recognize this. Discontinuity is one of the greatest challenges of biblical theology, right? I mean, if, if, you, wanted, if, if you wanted to ask what is the hardest question, I think the hardest question is going to be, how do I connect Old and New Testament? It's really hard. You have a lot of issues to try to figure out there. And that's essentially what's going on with dispensational and covenant theology. If you wanted to define dispensationalism and covenant theology, basically the definition is they are two different approaches to trying to put these together. These are two ways that people try to integrate Old Testament and New Testament. It is interesting though, to observe that the differences in the Testaments, the discontinuities in the Testaments, find their root and their basis in one event, and that would be the coming of the Messiah. The first and most basic fact of the Bible is the fact that it divides into two halves that are different. Okay? If, if, you know, if somebody just picks up a Bible for the first time, they don't know anything about it, the first thing they probably should learn, there are two Testaments, Old Testament, New Testament, and they are different. And it, it, I would suggest that on some level, other proposals for understanding the canon or integrating it might oddly fail to account for this discontinuity because they focus on continuity. Okay, validly so, we want to demonstrate that Old Testament and New Testament are speaking to the same truth. We want to demonstrate that they are proposing the same salvation, that it is the same God, that it's not Old Testament bad, New Testament yay, right? We want to do that validly so. But might we actually ignore the differences and discontinuities between the two and as a result miss this pretty obvious, obvious critical fact? I would suggest even the arrangement of scripture itself highlights that there is an epochal change standing at the middle of the canon. That anyone who comes to the message of scripture or picks up a Bible and, and, and looks at what's going on here would or should ask, why are these two halves so different? And what stands at the middle that makes them so different? What changed there? What happened there, right? Every, things kind of continue on with a certain kind of continuity and then there's a massive change and then it continues on with a different kind of continuity. So what happened in the middle? What happened at that event? And I just listed here some of the, some of the ideas that are uh, discontinuity, circumcision, uh, is put aside, baptism becomes a new institution. The Passover is put aside. The Lord's Supper is, is in some way, it's a continuation somewhat, but it's, it's different. It's definitely a replacement. Mosaic covenant replaced by the new covenant. I'm recognizing, we all recognize the new covenant proleptically stretches back into the Old Testament. It's already at work. Abraham was saved by the new covenant proleptically, meaning ahead of time. All of those things, we're, we're on the same page there. I'm just saying, we call it the new 
Testament, the new covenant for a reason, right? Hebrews 8 is telling us the new covenant has come. So it's valid to say the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, is recording the new covenant. Dietary restrictions versus inclusion of the Gentiles. Go back to Acts 10 and look at Peter's response when God offers him these animals. No, Lord. I mean, no, Lord. He's saying it to the Lord. Well, there's a very strong response there. Even what Dr. Oberlin has highlighted for us, centripetal versus centrifugal missions, right? That in one, it seems that the trend, the primary emphasis is the drawing of the nations and in another, go out to the nations, okay? What stands at the center between these two that, that, that really cleaves the entire Bible into these two halves? That though they are coherent, though they don't contradict each other, they are distinct, right? They stand as different. What makes that happen? And I think Jesus as the center best fits the nexus or the, the, um, the overlap, the interplay, the um, intersection of the narrative arc diachronically connecting the most literary parts together. It's probably not the clearest sentence in the world, I apologize. But what I mean by that is as the story gets told through time and all of these pieces are here, the different books of the Bible, Jesus as the center connects them. This is true even in respect to the climax of the biblical plot line. If you want to take a look at this later, you can feel free. But, you know, even it's just kind of interesting to me. The climax, a climax usually comes kind of three-fourths towards the end. Okay? Open your Bible. <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of anticipation. And then he comes. And there, you could argue that the New Testament is the climax that the New Testament is the grand unveiling he has come. Okay, before I go down that route and try to explain my case, why not others? In other words, I'm going to, um, I'm going to try to explain what I mean and opposed to other possibilities because there are other themes that get thrown about. Evaluating some of the other options, several of the pro proposed themes are arguably at the core of biblical thought. I would argue, though, that a lot of them are linear or more directional, meaning they, they point somewhere in a progressive way that develops across the entire canon, but maybe not so much acknowledging what stands at the center, this big divide, this splitting of the Bible into two halves. Covenant and kingdom both highlight a linear progression, so they trace progressive revelation as it builds across the entire canon. Do they adequately explain why everything changes at the beginning of the New Testament? I'm not sure that they quite do. Granted, I said below here, you know, Jesus announces the kingdom has come, and I interact with that idea a little bit below. Granted, we could say covenant promises in the Old Testament, fulfillment in the New Testament. I think there are some reasons that those things do not fully answer the question here, and you can read my note there if you're interested in that. Promise fulfillment Fulfillment accounts for this reality a lot better, but it still leaves questions. The Old Testament has lots of fulfillments, and the New Testament makes lots of promises. So we would not want to say something like, the Old Testament is about promise, the New Testament is about fulfillment. I don't think we would want to say that. There's lots of fulfillment in the Old Testament, and the, Old, the New Testament gives me lots of promise. So I'm not saying any of these things are bad themes. I mean, each one of these that I've said have long history and they're big ideas. And if you're going to go with the proposal of several things in the middle, I think almost for sure kingdom and covenant will be there, right? I mean, I think they almost, they just kind of have to be. But I would argue maybe that what I'm doing with center and by what I mean is by center, what stands in the middle, I think Jesus Christ fits this better than any of the others. If some themes might not ex explain the dramatic change, another group seem oriented to one testament or the other. So covenant or promise kind of seems to have an Old Testament priority. In other words, I feel like that's probably starting with the Old Testament and then the New Testament kind of um, becomes the continuation, but it's primarily rooted Old Testament side. Uh, conversely, kingdom and redemption seem to have a New Testament priority. I think you're kind of taking the New Testament and then you're running backwards with it. All of these ideas, I understand, we've talked about them here in this class, they have roots that go all the way through the whole Bible. I understand that. 
but I think there's some kind of emphasis on whether one side or the other. So whether taking the Old Testament as foundational or you using the New Testament as the lens to interpret the Old, I think these themes don't explain as clearly anyway the connection between the Testaments or the, the division between the Testaments as clearly as Christology does. Uh, one more thing I'll throw out here would be um, the glory of God. My feeling is the glory of God, while it is an important biblical theology theme, um, I think it probably offering it as the primary theme might have a little bit more of a systematic theology feel to it because I think what you're doing there is thinking about what is the purpose for everything, right? You're asking a teleology question. What is the purpose? What is the end goal? What is the conclusion of all things? in a way that is, I think, a little bit more teleological and a little bit more systematic oriented than maybe just taking the biblical data and asking myself what gets emphasized all the way through. Okay, so that would be my argument or my, my contention there. Okay, um, if you have a question, pop it up there, I'm watching, uh, feel free. I'll keep on going here. And I'm gonna argue here, I'm gonna move a little faster on this section. If you wanna go back and read it, feel free. I'm going to argue that when we're looking at the Testaments, okay, and we're seeing Jesus Christ standing at the center, he accounts for the change. Basically then, with him as the center, the Old Testament becomes this massive anticipation of him. When will he come? What is the answer? How will we understand? How will we see him when he comes? Okay. The Old Testament becomes this massive anticipation of him. The New Testament becomes the massive explanation of him. And that's, again, why I, I'm, I'm suggesting him as the center, because he explains those two sides. When I say Old Testament is incomplete without the Messiah, what I mean by this, I, I, mean, I mean really what I say, even if it sounds a little bit, um, a little bit uh, too strong. I, I mean by this, this, had the Messiah never come, the Old Testament would be a failed document, right? The Old Testament would not be true had the Messiah never come. Because the Old Testament is constantly saying, he'll come, he'll come, he'll come. It'll be like this. Here he comes. Wait, just wait. Here's your hope. He's the answer, right? He has to come. If he doesn't come, the Old Testament is a failed document. And in that sense, then, the Old Testament is incomplete without the Messiah, meaning it very much definitely strongly has to point to the Messiah. I used the metaphor before of saying like uh, two sides of an archway, you know, you build up, you build up, then you build up on the other side. But the higher you get, if you don't get that keystone in there soon, the whole thing collapses. The Old Testament builds up, builds up, builds up, and you're just waiting, and then the Messiah comes. Okay, but if the Messiah had not come, the Old Testament is, a complete, is, is an incomplete document. Um, one pointer then is what we're going to talk about here. I'm going to give three groups, three groups of Old Testament precedents in three general categories. Um, the uh, a good comment from John Glass, excellent. This would explain the tragic sadness of the Jewish religion today. You're, you're exactly, absolutely right. Three categories here, things that you never would have noticed. What I mean by that is, had the New Testament not said it, you would not, not have guessed it. Things that would have seemed anomalous. In other words, you would have read your Old Testament and said, what? and things that just did not make sense or did not have, let's say, their fulfillment, explicit statements about the Messiah. Okay? Uh, here, let me give some of these, and I'll move quickly just for time. First category would be things like Melchizedek. I mean, would I have read Melchizedek and thought, image of the Messiah? I don't, I don't think I would have. Okay? The ult ultimately, the, ult the New Testament is what tells me about his significance. We see that Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus' day and was glad. I don't even know what passage I would point to to say that, right? I just know that, that he did, but we're not sure exactly what's being discussed. Um, Jesus argues from Yahweh's revelation of, of himself as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to prove the resurrection. We heard a really good explanation. I think it was Dr. Taubert that talked about this. Yes, it was. Really good explanation. But had I only had the Old Testament, I would not have grabbed that. Jesus had to point it out to me. Statements such as Matthew's challenging use of the Old Testament, out of Egypt I have called my son. I mean, they're pointers to Christ, but not in any way that an Old Testament reader would have observed. Right? An Old Testament reader would not have come there and said, aha, the Messiah will spend a certain amount of time in Egypt before he comes back up. It's, you're not going to get that. 
Okay? Those things God put there. And later the Old Testament, the New Testament says, I put that there. That's on purpose. That's not a mistake. Look at that one. Right? So it's intentional and it's true. But the Old Testament text alone, you probably would not have caught it. Questions that the Old Testament raises. Another group of passages would have pointed us in a way that left us kind of scratching our heads. What is this talking about? Um, and uh, you have things like how quickly sacrifices appear in the Old Testament record. It's extraordinary. How are Cain and Abel offering sacrifices? And how often they occur, even before Sinai, certainly afterwards. So clearly from the very beginning of biblical revelation, there is the expectation that something must die because of sin. That builds. The sacrifice of Isaac bothers us, right? There's, there are whole philosophical frameworks of thought that came out of people at Kierkegaard, Torian Kierkegaard, struggling with this incident, this pericope. He builds, basically his philosophy is built on this or starts from this starting point. And if that bothers us, the answer is pretty simple. The New Testament answers our question. Isaac is pointing to another sacrifice of another son. It's that simple. So that God did this to show us he would offer his own son. Exodus 12 expands this, explaining the Passover. The oldest child dies, except for in the homes of those who believe. And in their homes, the lamb is the substitute. The lamb still dies, right? Something's going to die. Okay, it's either your son dies or a lamb dies, one or the other. In this case, then, if you are believing, the lamb dies in place of your son. In short, Israel has a substitute for the death of their oldest son. And the answer is the lamb pointing way ahead. The Passover is going to be fulfilled in Jesus. He is God's unique son. Incredible. Another group of passages point to a mysterious coming one. I'm going to go into this because we've done lots with this. But the seed of Abraham, Genesis 3.15, Abrahamic covenant, descendant of David. Passages like Isaiah 9, 6, how can he be born, but he's God. Daniel 9, 26, the Messiah will be cut off, but he has authority over all things. What? How would an Old Testament believer have read Psalm 110, verse 1? The Lord says to my Lord. Jesus brings this up and all of, all of the religious leaders are confused and don't know what to say. How is it that the Son is parallel with Yahweh, Right? You, you accept the reign of Yahweh, submit to Yahweh, kiss the sun. <laughs> the, the sun is parallel with Yahweh. How is that possible? How can Zechariah talk about Yahweh sending someone with the result that Yahweh will be in their presence? In other words, I will send someone so that I will be in your presence. I will send someone, then I will be in your midst. Meaning Yahweh sent Yahweh. That's what that means. Yahweh sent Yahweh. All of these things require a New Testament answer. But they require a New Testament answer in the, in the form of the Messiah. Explicit statement, a final category of prof, passage, passages, who is the prophet who Yahweh will raise up? Who is the faithful priest who will act according to God's intentions? So I, I said to you before, pay attention to this, the idea. There's many, there are many angels of the Lord. There's only one, the angel of the Lord. There are many sons, but there is only one, the son of God. Right? There is only one, when you're talking about a sweet, sweet, sweet generis, the Holy Spirit. There's only one like that. There is only one, the prophet, the faithful priest. And if you look at these New Testament references, pretty fascinating how they say it that way. Certainly, the Davidic king who reigns forever points to this grand promise, but also you see this the rising star coming out of Judah, the one shepherd to be prince over God's people, Psalm 110, Daniel 7, Isaiah 53, Zechariah 9, Zechariah 12. They're really shockingly clear in their predictions. Um, reading through the Bible in a short span of time, coming to Isaiah 53 feels like you've been reading straight through the Old Testament, you feel like you stopped and you, actually, you accidentally mixed up a page and you must have slipped and got in a page of Romans because Isaiah 53 is just so incredibly clear. So there is in conclusion, no coherent way to understand the Old Testament apart from the Messiah. This paragraph right here, I wanna highlight, it's very important because remember what I'm arguing. I'm arguing that Jesus is the center of the Bible. 
And as such, then the Old Testament is the anticipation of him. Can I, can I argue that um, objectively and prove my case? Or is it just kind of, well, I think I see more of this, you think you see more of this, so we can do a count and see how many, you know, whose numbers are bigger or something. Well, you have these statements where the New Testament actually points to this and says it. Okay? We have statements like this. We learn that the scriptures are they that bear witness about me, John 5.39. Okay, he's summarizing the entire Old Testament. The Old Testament bears witness about me. After his, uh, his resurrection, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Okay, so he can open up his Old Testament and explain about himself. The prophets speak of him, Acts 10, 43, so, so clearly that Paul can spend his time testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. This is the end of the book of Acts. Basically, Paul is sitting with people and just using his Old Testament, he's demonstrating Christology. And on the basis of those texts, I feel really strong in saying, if there is any subject that scripture points to as the subject of the Old Testament, right? I mean, if you can't find other verses, I don't think, that are going to state this as clearly. Verses that specifically say the subject of the Old Testament is this, Jesus, the promised Messiah, has come, right? I don't think you'll find that kind of clear demonstration as the New Testament demonstrates for us. Um, uh, let's see comment to be made here about just relationship of New Testament and Old Testament I've already mentioned before. But I, I think you want to go ahead as a biblical theology student, I want you to, I think you want to go ahead and interpret these Old Testament texts in the light of the Messiah. Right? And while you do your best to understand or recognize the progressive revelation that's there, you do also have to accept or build these texts in your understanding the significance, the full significance of Daniel 7 is demonstrated by the New Testament. That's part of the way that you should understand that text. So don't, don't bracket the New Testament out. In other words, don't, if you're a New Old Testament theology student, don't pretend that the New Testament doesn't exist. You can't. Right? Do your exegesis of the Old Testament text as it stands. Do your exegesis first but when you have finished your exegesis of that Old Testament text, you have to bring in the New Testament because these two go together in, in an absolutely inseparable way, inseparable way. You don't want to disconnect them. Okay, any questions or comments? I saw a good comment here uh, from Brother Mike Peterson, but uh, just give a, a quick question or a quick pause here if anyone else wants to chime in with something. While, I, while you're doing that, I'll just put up this diagram that I have showed you before. This is from some work I did with missions, uh, Old Testament and New Testament. So anyway, you can ignore the top. But um, basically, this is what I'm arguing here. Is Jesus standing at the center? My argument is this, that the Old Testament all points down to this, and the New Testament expands out from that. Okay? And the lines come together at their focal point there. While I, um, I think there are definitely lots of other ways to, to organize our presentation, of the Testaments and how they relate. I still very much feel that this focal point idea, if we're going to use center, and we're gonna use center the way I'm using it, I think this focal point idea is, I think it's, I think it's pointing to Christ very strongly. Um, I didn't see any questions come through, and so I'll keep on moving for a few more minutes here, and then feel free to bring up questions if you have them. Um, Okay, New Testament exposition of Jesus coming. I didn't have time to work this out in a full, like typing out my sentences. So I put this in an outline format, but uh, you can see the ideas here. Start with this idea. The structure of the New Testament itself. Okay, gospels with huge passion narrative. If you're talking about the amount of content that is in the New Testament, okay, the gospels are nearly half. And if you look at the gospels, the Gospels in the Passion Narrative, okay, the content that's just in the Passion Narrative is at least a third. In the case of John, it's basically a good half again. So you basically discovered that a huge proportion of the total revelation in the New Testament is the Passion. Okay? That should tell you something about the emphasis that the New Testament is giving you. 
should be striking. Uh, one comment that is really fascinating here, if you want to know what is the section of the New Testament that has the most Old Testament references and quotations, it's the passion narrative. The passion narrative of Jesus is absolutely packed with quotes from the Old Testament, which again is telling you in some way all the threads are coming together here. All the lines are drawing together to this one point, the passion narrative in Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, together with that, I would say the sheer immensity of the verses discussing Jesus in the New Testament. Okay? What I did down here in the note here below, if you want to paste this in, it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you just look at the first verse, or since that's arbitrary, we recognize verses are a thing that were later, added later. And so verses are not, you know, they're not inspired. So if you look at uh, the, the division of verses are not inspired. If you look at the first verse, or in some cases, if it's a short verse, let's say like the first two verses of every book, and you laugh, look at the last verse or the last few verses of every book, basically around I think like 90%, I'd have to do a count up and get numbers exactly, but around 90% of the New Testament books either start or end with direct reference to Jesus Christ. That is true of no other thing. Nothing else is like, I mean, you have some things that come up a lot, grace, mercy. I mean, there are things that come up a lot, God the Father, but not on all of them. Those are mainly Pauline. Right? And if you look at these verses, each one of these you're finding a very consistent pattern, not all, but very consistent pattern as you go through the entire, and through the entire New Testament that way. Um, here, a casual count. Okay, what I did here, I just did a search on Logos. And Logos will let you search by person. Okay, so I just searched for person Jesus of the New Testament. 7,164 instances, direct references in 3,748 verses out of a New Testament total of 7,941, meaning this is not talking about discussion about Jesus, Christology, let's say like the huge extended discussion in Hebrews 1 all the way down through chapter 2. Those verses aren't going to be counted. Verses that say either Jesus Christ, Messiah, or he, him, referring back to him, it would be basically half of every verse in the New Testament references Jesus in some way. That's, that's incredibly striking. It's an extraordinary thing. If you search for Son of Man, Son of God, Jesus Christ, Lord, or Messiah, just those, you get 2,294 hits in 1,714 verses. Now, that's a lot less, but it's still just those titles, just those titles, okay? You're still looking at, you know, pushing 25% of every verse in the New Testament uses one of those titles. That's, in, that's insane. It's just absolutely incredible. The epistles explaining, okay, of course the huge use of the title Christ, which we've talked about this before, the title Christ kind of becomes this dead word, Messiah, read Messiah there, okay? And when it's saying Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, that Jesus, that's what it's saying. Okay? Tying these, the testaments together, he is the fulfillment of all this that came. Even the morphing of the titles from Son of Man, Son of God, the Christ, the Lamb. In other words, as you walk through the New Testament, there are certain sections, the Gospels primarily Son of God, Son of God, Son of Man in, in the synoptic, Son of God in John. And then you move into the, the Acts and the Epistles and you go more into Christ, all the way to Revelation where it becomes the Lamb. Even that is just kind of striking because it's like the New Testament is, is taking you on this road to describe the Messiah in different ways, the sheer diversity pointing to that theme. In the epistles, union with Christ is a big idea. Salvation by the sacrifice, right? Salvation by the substitute of Jesus. This is absolutely central to our theology. So that's doing the systematic side of things. That's a factor, I think. Revelation is built around the lamb and his actions, okay? It is, after all, the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay? And I take that in both a subjective, genitive, and objective, genitive sense, if you know what I mean by that. Jesus reveals, Jesus is being revealed. So both of those things are going on. But I would say, as you start out the book of Revelation, first words, the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning Jesus Christ will now be revealed. Jesus Christ will now reveal. So what do you get? 
you get a vision of Jesus, right? John sees him standing there and the full description of him. And then you hear about Jesus' words to the seven churches. He says this, this, this to each church. Thus says the one having the sword coming from his mouth, right? I mean, it's Jesus all the way through each one of these. And then Jesus opens the seals, which open the trumpets, which open the bowls. So Jesus stands behind all the judgments. Jesus stands all the way to the end behind the great victory. He comes on the great white horse. He's the one who conquers. And then how does the book end? The book ends with a revelation of Jesus and Jesus is speaking in the last verses of the book. Jesus is the speaker. And that's the end of the Bible. The end of the Bible is the words of Jesus. So the, the gospel started off, all of them presenting Jesus, right? I mean, all the way from Matthew, the generation of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham, son of David, all the way to John, in the beginning was the word. The gospel started off with this proclamation of Jesus and revelation ends with the speech of Jesus. I am the one who has revealed these things to John. I am coming soon. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. I mean, this is the way the book ends. So I, I, I think just that data pulls you together and you're, you're left inexorably having to conclude this is clearly the theme of this book. Now, I'm going to end out with, just because of uh, constraints on time, um, I'm going to end out with this section down here. And what this is, where it says Appendix, the Search for a New Testament Center, this actually is a paper I wrote, I think, seven years ago or something. And if you go through this paper, what I was asked to do in a class was to write an answer or a paper discussing this, this topic that we talked about tonight. So th a lot of this would be review. And if you want to read through it, that's why I put it as an appendix. Uh, I, would, I would understand it as kind of uh, a review or a summary of everything we just went through. But to fill out the rest of my ideas or to finish out our concepts here, I would still suggest, even though I've argued very strongly tonight, that Jesus is the center, I would still argue that there are, is a set of ideas that kind of go outward as a chain from that center. Okay? So to use my metaphor again, Jesus standing at the center, you would have links of the chain that stretch outward from the center. If this is Christ, then you're going to have links that will stretch outward that connect from that. Okay? And those links moving outward would take you in the direction in both testaments, outward from this core fundamental theme in the middle, outward into the conclusions or the foundation of both testaments. Okay, does that make sense? So I think, I think we could make some other links or some other themes that I would be perfectly, of course, happy to, happy for us to acknowledge in connection with this theme. But I do think this theme probably stands uh, the theology or that the, this, this Jesus Christ is the center stands in a particular and special role, even while we go outward with some of these other themes. What would be some of those themes that stretch outwards? Well, in the case of the Old Testament, okay, I would feel pretty strongly to say, or feel pretty confident in saying, the things that stretch outward would just be the covenants. Okay? That as you think through the covenants, the Abrahamic, Davidic, and New Covenant, each one of them are developing uh, and pointing to the coming Messiah. Okay? Now you can do lots more. You can do the sacrificial system. You can do the whole temple and the priests. You can do prophet, priest, and king. Uh, that's actually what I did do in my paper. If you read the appendix, I actually based it on prophet and priest and king idea. But using this, this diagram or this idea, I just drew this as a way I think of trying to visualize for myself a little bit. What do I mean by the, um, what do I mean or how do I understand the covenants, okay? So the red on the far extreme would be like the Abrahamic covenant. And in the early days then of Revelation, the Abrahamic covenant is the primary way that we're learning about the Messiah. The blue, if we think of that like the Davidic covenant, okay, it's coming later and it's a little bit broader in its reach. And the green would be like the new covenant. It's stretching even broader than that. There are pieces of the new covenant that run all the way up into the Pentateuch. There are some little things that kind of sound more like the new covenant happening in Deuteronomy. Primarily, the Pentateuch is going to be about the Abrahamic covenant, but there are some hints. There are some hints of the Davidic covenant all the way up then, all the way up in that time. 
when you come into the Davidic covenant, there's some mixture. There's some echoes of the Abrahamic covenant, and there's some kind of pre-echoes of the new covenant. Okay? When you come to the new covenant, some of the other covenants are mixed in there as well. But these three covenants are building together, and they're all moving to the same place, which is the Messiah. So I think those would be the links of the chain that I would see going towards the Messiah. Um, when you come, and then, I, as I said, if you wanted to do lots more with the sacrificial system, prophet, priest, and king, if you want, read through the paper there. I think I think I tried to demonstrate pretty strongly that the prophet, priest, and king idea is also central or stretches across. When you come to the New Covenant, what would be some of the links that stretch across the New Covenant, or excuse me, the New Testament? Uh, I have these in my paper, and you'll see those uh, those New Testament links stretching forward, Okay coming out of the Gospels, the links I would suggest would be from the person of Christ going to redemption, or let's just say our salvation, the results of our salvation. So because of the person of Christ, his person and his work, the result of that is I can experience salvation. Uh, second link, kingdom of God. I think that's, of course, such a huge core idea with all its eschatological implications and so forth. Uh, at this point, I said I wrote this paper about six or seven years ago. At this point, I would probably include in here something like the people of God, the new people. And then here, the glory of God, I think probably I would pull this out now, and I would probably view the glory of God as a systematic umbrella that goes across everything. And I might put here in its place something like dwelling with God or relationship with God or restoration or consummation or victory. And basically what's happening at the end of all time. So there could be different ways to configure these themes, these other links, these other pieces that are going outwards. But I would say if I was going to summarize what we've discussed here today and try to put that into one piece uh, just for our consideration here. I would say I feel very strongly about the center. I feel very strongly that Jesus Christ is the center explains the diversity of the Testaments, or I should say the difference, the change, what happened between Malachi and Matthew. I think the New, the New Testament or the beginning of the New Testament points me so strongly to Jesus. The coming of the Messiah explains that. So I feel very strongly about that center the links going outwards, I think there I would be willing to do some kind of different configuration. Okay? I could see some differences in the way we set that up. Um, and I could feel fine, perfectly fine about doing that in different ways. But I would still probably argue with someone if you wanted to replace what stands at the center. Okay? If you wanted to say something like, what is the goal, the, the end of all things? Of course, the glory of God. Definitely, I can sign up for that. If you want to say uh, a pattern or something like that that stretches across the Bible, maybe you could set it up in a way that you could do promise fulfillment or covenant, something like that. Maybe I could sign up for some of those things. I think if you're going to say center, what stands at the center? Jesus Christ. And that core then defines for us how we work with the rest of what stands there. Okay. Uh, if you are continuing to be interested in some of these discussions, read through the notes. There is I probably there are 10 pages here that uh, we did not get to. So read through those notes, work, interact with those things if you want. Lots more to discuss there. Um, I'll hand it back over to Dr. Oberlin. And then if you have questions here to finish out our lecture, send them on. And we have about all of about five minutes to answer any questions that you have. Great, thank you, Dr. Arnold. I love um, love the work here, and I was thinking one one idea as you were uh, talking through this: the idea of the fact that Christ, Jesus Christ, is the Creator of all things, and so that seems to be a basis or really a strong point for your position, in the sense that before there was anything, He is the origin of all things, and therefore all things have to point to Him. All things have to be. Uh, prominent, and he needs to be the center of all things. So um, I really like I like what you presented and um, seems very powerful and uh, a great point, and I'm sure a blessing to all of us who know Jesus as our personal Savior, our Lord, and wanting to make the center of our lives. So I hope you are enjoying um, these lectures, not just simply as an academic or head knowledge, of course, our desire is not just simply that, you know, after a lecture like this, you just increase this, this, this ability, this, this level of knowledge, 
But what we really hope is that your passions for Jesus, passions for God grow coextensively or coterminously as your knowledge of him increases, your passions of, for our Lord also increase. And that's, of course, ultimately what we're doing this for, um, so that we can be servants of the Lord and also in, and, uh, encourage others to love our Savior as well. So we thank you for Dr. Arnold and his um, message, uh, really exalting Christ and allowing our passions to, um, to even grow to new heights because of our knowledge of him. And so um, we'll have a word of prayer here and just close out um, our session. And I see Edgar there, and maybe we could turn Edgar's uh, microphone on. And Edgar, um, if you would, I'd love for have, having you pray. It's great to see you um, and uh, that you were able to jump on here. And uh, would you just close us in prayer um, today? You mean me? Yeah, Edgar. Oh, Edward from Germany. Yes, Edward. Yes, I'm okay, sorry, Edward, Edward, I mean. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I pray for us. Thank you. My, my English is not that good, but I'll do my best. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your word encourages us uh, and gives us hope and strength in our lives. Thank, thank you that you did not only speak, to, uh, just create the world or speak to us, but you came to us. Uh, you, you, are, uh, you came to us uh, in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that you are, we are able to learn um, from your word. And I ask that we would be able to understand more and that our passion for you would grow also. I ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Goodbye.